Hi, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics located in Southgate, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey guys, we've loved answering all of your questions so far. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, please send them to us on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast or by email to wheeltalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. We already started. Oh, we are. <laughs> we are. You gotta, you gotta say that, right? All right, we're live. Becca's not here. She's not. We have a different person here. We yeah. have Deanna. How do you say your last name? Polsma. Polsma. Yeah, where's Dutch. That, where's that Dutch? Okay. Yeah, my dad was born in the Netherlands, so. Yeah. Have you ever been there? I have not. I had plans. 2020 got canceled. Okay. Had to return the tickets. Okay. Sad day. So does your so you still have a lot of family there? So? Yeah, I have aunts, uncles, cousins. My grandparents have always kind of traveled back and forth a couple times a year. Um, okay. But now my grandpa has um, dementia, so they don't go as much. But okay. I still want to go and see where they're from. And then where's your mom from? So my mom was born and raised in Florida. Background is just like some uh, Native American, some Irish, some. Just so everything. they met in Florida then? They met in Florida, yeah. So my dad okay. was born in the Netherlands and family moved over when he was a kid. And so born and raised in the small town in Florida that I'm from called Bradenton, which learning is Wait, not Bradenton? as... Bradenton? Bradenton, yeah. That's, is that Sarasota, it's okay. so, yeah, south of Tampa. So. I did like spring training and stuff You there, do, right? yeah, Pittsburgh Pirates. That's how I do that, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Sweet, okay. So, so born and raised there. Yeah. And then how long, and where do you live now? I live in Indiana now. So oh, I yeah, went to yeah. school in Ohio, uh, went to school for art, and then went back to Florida at one point and realized it was really hot and expensive and not what I remembered <laughs> as yeah. a kid. Okay. Um, and my partner Brandon is from southern Indiana, like tri-state near Cincinnati where you're at. Okay. And we both missed, because uh, we met in Columbus, Ohio, so we're like, well, let's be close to someone's family. Let's be close to your family, because yeah. most of my family was still in Florida at the so did you go to Ohio State? No, I went to uh, Columbus, Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio. Okay. So there's like... It's a no, pretty small school. So, I mean, yes and no, but... It I seems like kind of like a local... Is it like a local kind it's of thing? It's technically a, a private school. Do? Like most art schools are considered a private school. Yeah. But um, I want to say my graduating class was like 200, 250 people. So okay. not tiny, but... Right there in downtown Columbus, there's actually like five colleges in a five square mile area, so it's yeah. very much a college town right there. So. Okay, and you're right there by Ohio State. Ohio yeah. State, so like <laughs> most of those people, yeah. Yeah, there's okay, a lot cool. of colleges right there. So. Gotcha. Okay, and then you're in Indianapolis now. We yes. both know Becca. Yes. You know Becca well. Yes. Well, you're around Becca a lot All the time. more than I. So yeah, <laughs> and that's kind of how we cross paths. Yeah. Um, I think it's just through Instagram or something, and then somehow we. Got yeah, that way. it's really just because I'm a creeper, right? Like listening. To, so it all started because I was listening to uh, a talk. There was the Ohio Clay Conference, and Becca was doing a panel discussion there, and she was the like, "The Indiana Hi. one." Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, the Indiana yeah. Clay. Is that? I don't know you said Ohio said. Clay Conference. Sorry. Sorry, you meant the Indiana. Indiana Clay Conference. Indiana Clay Conference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she was doing a panel discussion there, and she's like, "I do a podcast," and then I started listening to the podcast as I was making art. I was like. Oh my god, these people are great. I want to be friends with them. They live close to me. Yeah, that goes <laughs> like right there. Yeah, and then I was doing a show one week and I was like, oh my god, she's here. So I went over to say hi and of course it was awkward because she doesn't know who I am. I'm right. Like, oh, I listen to you when it comes to my work. And she's like, oh, you actually have nice stuff. I'm like, thanks, Becca. Yeah, and she's not going to sugarcoat it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so that's kind yeah. of what I meant. Okay, and what's your business name? Uh, Glazed and Confused Creations. Where did that come so. from? Um, so glazing has always been the hardest part for me, right? When I do Have you ceramics. always made, what do you make? <laughs> so I do, context? um, mainly ceramic jewelry is kind of what I'm making and selling now. I call it art deco inspiration with a Caribbean flair for color. Caribbean flair for color. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, I also do a lot of sculptural pieces, very textural, looks completely different. Um, and that's more like stuff that I put in galleries. Don't okay. take that back to fairs and stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so glazing is... Glazing for the earrings specifically no, was always for hard, or for the sculptures? For the sculptures. Yeah, because okay. that's kind of where I started. When I was in college, I did ceramics and was doing my sculptural stuff, and that's kind of always what I've loved. Because I, I started off doing ceramics in high school, um, yeah. and I was like, well, I don't enjoy wheel throwing. Like, I can do it, but it's not my favorite. I want to make yeah. stuff like other people haven't seen before. Uh, and so I would love how something looked when it was leather hard. 
and then I'd fire it. And because I was at community places or at college, <clears throat> and like you have the dipping places in college, and I would try and brush, and it was just not great. Yeah. Um, so late in the year that I took, because um, I went to college, it was four years, but I graduated in three. And they didn't pass their air quality control <laughs> at my college, so they got rid of the glazed calc class when I was in school. Oh wow! So they like didn't I did ventilation or something. Exactly. Just raw materials and just mm -hmm. like another they, step above of risk. Yeah. So like they had a room where the um, studio tech would go in with a respirator and mix all the glazes for everyone and whatnot. But there used to be like a glazed calc class where you learned the science behind it all, and they couldn't yeah. offer that. They couldn't offer stone carving. Like there's a bunch of classes they had to cut until they got wow. their uh, air quality, like, ventilation upgraded to pass the standards. And okay. then they reopened, but that was, like, after I graduated. So. Right. So that was a bummer. So I always have struggled with glazing because of that. And then it's like, I need something that's, like, someone will remember, right? Like, my, as you saw, you can't spell my name, right? If yeah. you Google me, I'm the only one, but no one's going to remember that. Well, then you're, like, that. Deanna's Creations. <laughs> Deanna. And the Creations is good because it's, like, doesn't necessarily mean like pottery it doesn't mean ceramics right. it can mean whatever and then and that's kind of where it came from so i have a very varied background so like i said i was in college i did ceramics but i also did a lot of actual jewelry making like casting stone setting all of that fun stuff i did some glass casting and some um glass casting yeah so what do you cast it is that in like sand or something like, no so like no, like, like bronze would, is in sand and stuff right uh it's <clears throat> we i did only one bronze casting in terms of sculptures, but for the smaller scale, it's plaster. Plaster. Okay. Um, for the small scale metals, we would do like wax carvings, and then you'd cast plaster around it, and then it was a lost wax casting using what's called a centrifuge to throw the metal into the mold while okay. it's molten. I think um, I've seen that at NKU, yeah. They did it, and they get the all the heavy set stuff, and they clamp it, and then they pour it. So that's that's the big casting. A yeah. centrifuge is literally like. A turntable you turn it around and you let it go and it spins so fast that it literally whips the molten metal <laughs> into oh. your plaster mold oh and so gosh. it's really small you have like I think around three inches is kind of the biggest you can do uh -huh. but when you see a lot of like casted rings or earrings or bracelets like that's how that casting process is done okay. um, so I've done some of that I did a lot of watercolors I still do watercolors and then when I moved here to Indiana, I did art restoration for okay. a long time, too. So when I was trying to form the business, I knew ceramics was what I love to do. But I was like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself yeah. into one medium because I wasn't really sure what was going to sell because my uh -huh. sculptures are so big. I was like, ah, I don't know. And the jewelry is fun, but there's lots of jewelry out there. And uh -huh. because I was doing the watercolor, so I was like, we're just going to say creations, and that covers all of it. Right. And then doing, um, I used to do arts administration for a long time. So if I did consulting, like, it would yeah. fall under that umbrella, too. So. Okay. And you're just confused because I told you all the things yeah. <laughs> that I do, and you're like, and that's what? And that's just a good name, actually, <laughs> to confuse. It's like, yeah. it's a good plant words. Um, and then we're, so we're in person now. At the show this weekend. What show are we at? We have the Berea Craft Festival. Berea Craft Festival. I've been Festival. corrected on, not Berea. Berea or Berea. Berea. <laughs> Did you hear some people say it today? Yeah. Like, okay. Well, I had always said, I don't know why, Berea, and then Rachel was like, it's Berea, and then everyone today is like, Berea. I'm like, okay, Berea it is. So like, where are you it. from? Berea? And the, you know, yeah. Because there's a lot of people that just ask you where you're from and stuff. Oh, yeah. What part of Kentucky are you from? Or where? Because they say some of the, some of the emails were saying, like, put the city where you're from or whatever, but people ask me anyway so yeah it's like, and i don't i'm so i just kind of rebranded too so i'm working on a sign and so i have no signage and they're like where are you who are you i'm like what, oh yeah. yeah so that's been fun okay yeah so with you and this is your first time doing this show right it is yes how were your expectations coming into it yes like what, i mean so far think? so so far so good honestly doing a show in a forest like that is awesome because like who doesn't want to be like under the canopy all day long and you don't have the blazing sun on you and uh -huh. If it does rain, you know, hopefully the trees will stop it a little bit. Yeah, that does <laughs> it's not just fun. a massive windstorm like yeah. hurricane winds coming through. Yeah, and then the ground's a little iffy with the mud and stuff. True. So like that's, but that's part of it. But, it, but it is a it is a good show so far. And then yeah. the um, this is the I think third or fourth year I've done it. Okay, I didn't really yeah. think about it so many times. Yeah, so this is like normally my best show of the year that I do. Oh, okay. So 
Awesome. Yeah, and it's like the only one that I do is three days too. You've done some three days. I, this so. is actually the first three day show that I've done. I've done oh, a really? bunch of two okay. days. I've not done a three day show. Or maybe you have you done a Friday? I feel like you said something about a Friday show. That There's you did. yeah. Sometimes I'll do events on a Friday and then go to a two day show on the weekend. So I do oh, three okay. days That's total, what you were but it's like it too. okay. Yeah. yeah. So I've never and like Friday shows are always very slow. So I thought this was great for I mean. And it's taken in two, so that I feel like if people are going to pay five or six bucks for a ticket, they're probably going to see every booth or right. most of the booths. Yeah, you're there to have a good time and see it all. It. Yeah, and they have the music all day and stuff. Okay, sweet. Yeah, hopefully good luck the rest of the weekend. Thanks. Hopefully we have a good weekend. Same it here. always rains at least one day, so oh, I don't know when that's going to happen. But It's Sunday, and well, right now it's like... 50, 60% all yeah. day. So. Well, the, and we're like kind of in the mountains a little bit, so it changes so rapidly. And like when we, you know, set up, it's going to rain or tear down, it's going to rain, or one day it's just going to rain for a couple hours. That's just going to happen. So. Okay. So you talked a little bit about your background, and we kind of we kind of got on this a little bit when we were at the Backer Craft Show, and you were talking about like, I get, I guess you want to talk more about like the other roles that you were doing in that background, the art administration, yeah. and kind of those dipping the toes in the different roles and yeah, what you got yeah. exposure to because, and then we'll get into like the art show stuff yeah that's definitely really, it really plays a part for people. sure um so when i was in ohio i worked at a local arts council and it was just kind of me and me and ruby a two-man team and then eventually brought some more people on and helped train them but i more or less was in charge of all things related to artists i helped out with some arts organizations but i was doing grant making for individual artists I was running the uh, artist exchange program with Dresden, Germany at the time, and then the, um, so it was the Columbus Arts Council puts on the Columbus Arts Festival, which is a multi-day arts festival on the riverfront in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, yeah, that's a big And so while that's its own department and things, it's an all-hands-on-deck for everyone that works there, so. Um, so you and Ruby were in. What team? We were the grants department. The grants so department. Okay. We did all the funding for arts organizations and individual artists. And, okay. Uh, it was Greater Columbus. And then the Arts Council as a whole is like how big of a <laughs> group? Uh, gosh. I think it was, it was either 10 or 12. 10 or so 12. it's pretty small. Okay. And um, that whole organization is the main planner of that one. Yes. Show that you yeah. Did. So there's, I mean, I don't know, because that would have been, what, 10 years? I left there in 2015. I was there for about five years. Yeah. So it's a big one, but at the time, there's only two people that run that whole show and put it oh all together. Gosh. It's a two-person department. That's so much work. And they run off of volunteers. I want to say there's hundreds of volunteers that they but rely on. they have on. only two people that plan the whole thing? And it's not like the staff. Just because the 10 to 12 people weren't weren't skilled in that? or they just... no, So you have like the festival director and the festival coordinator, and I mean, their kind of main roles are securing the spaces, getting permits and whatnot for street closures and security officers and coordinating the applications opening and closing and getting the the artists and answer questions right exactly all that stuff um and so the all hands on deck part the team of 12 everyone comes in and you're kind of broken up into like someone's manning the information booth someone's helping wrangle volunteers like everyone has their thing and usually when you have arts festival like this you have um committees so you have a group of dedicated people in a community that are Mm -hmm. just excuse me i want to see this happen and come together and so they plan all year long and they work with the two employees of the art council all year long to make it happen right um but yeah they're doing all that back end heavy lifting Mm -hmm. applications and that was like was it a two-day show three-day show i know it's two it might even be three i can't remember and then artist wise there's probably like what 150 Yes, 150, 200, somewhere in there. Because they expanded it at one point while we were there. A new bridge was built, and they expanded it across the bridge and over the river. And I know there's been construction over the years, and like I said, mm-hmm. it's been 10 years since I've been, so I don't know where it's at now. But mm-hmm. it's it's still a large festival. I feel like I saw an advertisement for it. It happened in the last month or so. Yeah, it, and theirs is one I didn't realize because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm finally going to be able to do it now that I'm making art. And um, the application's open in December, and it happens the first week of June, I think. Okay. So I, when I came January, February, application time, I was like, oh, I missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> you think you'd be able to get through the holidays right? and be like, all right, I can figure out the application. Yeah, no, that like deadline was like first week of December. I was like, all right, next oh year, gosh. noted. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
Okay, so you were playing in that. And how many years did you did you do that? All five years that you were there. Uh, so I was in the artist section for all five years, and because when I first started, we only had one individual. Actually, there was no individual artist program when I started, and then we helped kind of launch that and grow it. It was like three different grant programs. So uh -huh. I helped do grant applications, and there was individual artist fellowships, and like I said, running that artist exchange program, which mm -hmm. involved booking, um, finding galleries, booking gallery shows for the artists, getting accommodations over in Germany, getting accommodations, yeah. like that kind of stuff. And then, um, so after I did art restoration here in Indiana, I transitioned to the State Arts Commission here in Indiana again, but this time as a grants manager and oversaw all the granting um, at the Arts Commission. And then there was the director, but I did the kind of back end of making the applications live, answering technical questions in the system, making sure that it reflected, because whether it's a state arts agency or a local arts council, a lot of them are funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a grant-making federal government agency, and all of they, we have all of our own requirements that we have to give to the national mm -hmm. granting agency, so that was part of my role, was doing all of that data collection, analysis, reporting to the federal government, in addition to about those. like how many artists you have, where yeah. they come from, how mm -hmm. much money you're generating, how many your participants company. are have, yeah. So like, to, like total cash income, total cash expenses, how many participants, average age, like are they adults, or are they children? Yeah. What counties are served? What um, wow. counties are not served? Are they underserved populations based on certain criteria or not? Like that kind of stuff. Okay. So. Yeah. And that one was in. That was all in Columbus, or that second part you just talked about was in Indiana? That too. was here in Indiana. So okay. I didn't do most of that grant reporting in Ohio, but I did, in mm -hmm. Ohio, build, help build out the applications to include the data collection of all of that. Okay. So I love a good spreadsheet. Okay. <laughs> wow. So how many, so you knew, like, how many artists were joining, or, like, applying and getting through and stuff like that too so i didn't i was not involved in that part of it so that would have been the festival the festival part uh, people yeah okay but as part of like because i helped do the individual artist grant programs and i did like an opportunities newsletter of, mm -hmm. and things like that so when they would put it on i was allowed to go over and help them kind of set up so again things have changed since covid but back then they rented out a room at like the Hilton and they had five, five projector screens and it was the four images of your work in your booth shot and you have your jurors sitting there and you have like snack tables over here and the person running the show, usually the festival director of like getting, you go by category, flashing all the images. Is it different jurors screen. per category or is it all jurors get a vote and certain yeah. jurors get more weight because they're in that category or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and again, it, every Every event is different in how they handle and structure it. However, most places you have, like, when you read on this application, it'll tell you how many jurors there are. Usually it's between five and seven. You always have an odd number because you need someone who can split a vote if you're tied. Mm -hmm. so, and you don't want to leave it to, like, the festival director or something. That, right, conflict of interest, all that yeah. stuff. So usually five to seven. Um, jurors are varied backgrounds, right? And... Depending on if you know who your target audience is, the festival directors will reach out to, to artists who have participated in the past, longstanding, or just artists in the community, things of that nature, to be their jurors. Um, and, and sometimes they represent all the craft categories or art categories, and sometimes they don't. It just mm -hmm. depends on who's available, who wants to help, things like that. I mean, Those jurors get paid to do that? So that's the thing. Back in the day, they didn't. Nowadays, I think they do, but... Mm -hmm. Again, everyone's different. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's different. Depends on what your budget is, all that fun stuff. Okay. Um, so when you have, like, let's say you have 200 applications, you go by category. It's almost always shown in the order of, of which it's received or alphabetically, right? There's so kind of luck of the draw within the category where you're at. Images are flashed on the screen. And some places are yes, no, maybe. Sometimes it's a score one through five, sometimes it's a score one through ten, and if that's the case, a lot of times five and three are missing. That way you're forced as a juror to vote Seven. one way or another. Right. Um, and then it's kind of majority rules. So, like, mm -hmm. if you're all yeses, you're kind of, like, automatically on so the So they know round. immediately, like, when... Because it's all computerized, yeah. And then are they... Because um, they would... 
they would have an idea of how many spots they have per category, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. They would so know that like we have sixty jewelers and we only have thirty spots. So right. like, as you're going. So they know some of that. Sometimes they keep that in mind. It, and a lot, again, this comes down to when you're a juror. And I've, I've juried for fellowships. It's obviously very different for um, arts events. But in just listening to other friends who have done that in the past, a lot of times you're given direction on kind of what they're looking for because the festival director knows who their core audience is that's attending the festival. And, like, is it more crafts heavy? Is it more 2D? Is it more contemporary? And so sometimes they'll give their jurors, like, we're looking to bring in more of this this year. Like, mm -hmm. sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just strictly based on the merit of the work, which can only be seen through photographs. So unfortunately, a lot of times you're judged on the quality of your photographs. And you can have amazing, outstanding work, but if it doesn't translate, like, yes, yeah. And that's just what it is. Yeah. Because you're, it's flashed on the screen. Usually, it's eight to ten seconds to vote, and they move on to the next one. So, if you're not presenting good enough photos of your work and of your booth, and they move it on to the next one, and they show, do they show all of them at once, mm -hmm. or do they go all of them at once? And so, you as a juror sit there and you look at it. A lot of times, it'll have the statements in front of you. Sometimes they'll read it out to you if you need the statement read. But yeah. And then they'll move on to the next one. And if you haven't decided, you're sitting there trying to vote yes, no, maybe while it's cutting into the next eight to ten seconds on the next one. So uh -huh. if you're kind of like mm, on the fence, a lot of times you're just going to get a no because they couldn't decide right, right away. And so it, it's just it's a split second decision yeah. on the juror side. And it's like, man. And you said, does the is the room dark? Yes. Because I heard something about I think maybe Danny Meisinger was talking about it in his chat with. Rebecca yeah, on Baker's yeah, playbook. Yeah. Like he was talking about that it was like that's why you don't want a white background because it's white and really bright in a dark room, so it's like strenuous on your eyes or something. Right. Yeah. And so like if you're because we and you guys have talked about it. Or maybe you told me that. Yeah, I was telling you that because that was something that was brought up, but I'm sure other people have seen. But I heard Danny well. talking about that, and I was like, Ooh, I want to like learn more about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he. I think it was like episode 400 and something when on the Baker's playbook. Rebecca, yeah, Rebecca really about good. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when you imagine you're in this rented out conference room at a hotel, right? And you have all these people lined up, all these screens, and all the lights are off because it's being projected. And you're going through all these images that have that gradient background to make your piece pop. And all of a sudden, you're blasted with set you know, five white screens, right? You can't even see what's on the screen. You're like, oh my God, mate, stop. You just start like, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. on to the next one because it's going to let. Yeah. And if everyone votes in time, they move on to the next one. They don't necessarily wait the full eight to ten seconds. Okay. So. Because it's all computer, they're just like, all right, everybody's in. Yep, on to the next one. There okay. You go. Yeah. Wow. And so that's so why I say, like, nowadays I would imagine a lot more of it's done on Zoom because you have more access to more jurors. You know, you're not st stuck with, can people make this time this day? Mm -hmm. You know, parking all that stuff. And I'm sure there's technology to vote on another screen right. or on your phone while it's tied into sure. this system. Yeah. That I can log it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's been, like I said, it's been years, but that was my experience of watching. And there's, I mean, there's, um, it's called Jury Image Evaluation on Facebook. It's a group you can join and, like, you can scroll through where people post their pictures all the time. They get a lot of feedback. Uh, Larry... I'm going to butcher it. And I think it's Berman is his name. And he does um, mock juries for people so you can submit your work. And he mm -hmm. participates as a juror all the time. He's also a photographer. So he gives people all kinds of feedback. And then you can put your work in to do that mock jury and get feedback. So you can see if you've never had the opportunity to see a jury in person, that's something you can go through. And you can watch past ones on Zoom because I believe he records them and just kind of get a feel for what that's like in yeah. real time. Um, but also get your work critiqued if you're wanting to, like, kind of go up to the next level. Yeah, because it seems like it's, it's one of those things that seems kind of, like, hidden. Right. But I don't know if it's, like, hidden on purpose to, like, keep the jurors anonymous or keep, like, so you don't see what comments from it. But it sounds like if it's so quick, there's not there's time not for commentary. Comments. Yeah, so, I mean, it, so that's, that's one of like you're the... going to, like, shit on somebody in eight seconds. Like, yeah. you're not shouting, you know. That's what you don't want to skew other people's votes i would think too right and it's like so on the like when you're doing grants fellowship uh fellowships based on the merit of your work or grant applications where it's based on like project criteria things like that 
Like those are things that you can get feedback, right? If that's in there and lots of artists apply for grants and things like that. A lot of times mm -hmm. there's project grants to just go make work. And that's stuff that you can ask for feedback and almost always get. But when it comes to like art events and shows, there is not feedback because it is so instantaneous. You can reach out to the festival director and they have nothing to give you because there is no comment or feedback provided yeah, by and the jurors. Yeah, they'd have to reach out to the jurors and ask for those specifics. But if your thing is up for 10 right. seconds, like they could, they, don't, they probably don't even remember what their feedback was initially. Yeah. So a lot of times the best thing you can do is if you know someone, like I said, you can go on Facebook, get some feedback that way. If you know people who have um, participated as a juror before, kind of get their input or feedback on your piece. So like yeah. more recently, I've been trying to get feedback on mine because there's some larger shows and I know it's my booth that's holding me back because jewelry is the most competitive category. And something I did not realize until like a couple weeks ago getting this feedback, there are like, we're talking the large high-end art shows. Yeah. You have a table with tablecloths, a lot of them will say no automatically. Just out. Really? They want you to have panels, they want you to have like pedestals, panel walls, jewelry, like cases. Yeah. on tables like do you think it's just because it's so embedded because there's so many people that do it that like it just levels up their art show so by having that or is it just like they have the preference that like that's what they think is like legitimate i mean credible? at the end of the day i think it has to do with the curated experience that they're trying to create so every festival is trying to create a different experience right you mm -hmm. have all the the craft markets that are trying to make it more accessible for families to come and buy and participate in art. And then you have people that want it to look like you're walking into an art gallery or into a retail space where they want it to be high end and they want it to fetch those prices because those are people that'll do thousands of dollars for multi days mm -hmm. versus like a couple thousand, you know? So right. how you present your work can affect the quality or like, yeah, it's just all is interconnected. And so, for example, like with doing jewelry, having display cases, having fewer pieces out. Because, like, right now I have two main displays, and those hold, like, 36 pairs of earrings each on just these two main displays, plus I have more stuff. Like, yeah. we're talking hundreds of pieces out at once. Um, and putting more, like, 40 pieces out at once and putting them, giving them their own space, making it just it, taking them off of cards, like having something on cardstock cheapens it, lowers the price that you can fetch right. for the item, even if it is amazing quality and takes a ton of time. Like, if you're not presenting it in that manner, it makes it really hard for someone to come in and be like, yes, this is worth it, because they're not seeing it in that gallery setting, because those are the people who are going to come home, right? You've, you've gone into houses where you've seen a painting on a wall and someone maybe has that spotlight just over that painting, right? Because it's mm -hmm. their prized possession and, and they're presenting it the same way in their home. Mm -hmm. And so you are almost trying to present it that same way right. out in, in the forest yeah. in your 10 by 10 tent, but making it feel like it belongs like that at home, having its own space. Yeah, and there's not a separate category for you being ceramic jewelry. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's, it's you're just jewelry. jewelry. Yeah. Um, okay. And the competing with the metals and the, the and gems the and stuff, and, it's yeah. like... And their price points are probably way oh, the, yeah. higher than yours. So. You're talking just a solid gold necklace is eight hundred dollars, even if there's nothing else to it. That's the cost of solid gold, like versus. And that's where gold. like they can have fewer pieces out and still like it's okay, but yes. like you, yeah. I don't know. I'm you selling at shows like you probably know like the variety helps people. Oh yeah. Understand and it's like, would I sell more if I had fewer things on the table or? Is it like less busy for them and it's going to attract, but the show probably doesn't care whether like it looks more attractive and they don't care how good your sales are, I guess. No, I mean, they do because if you're as an artist, right. And like it, I mean, I would imagine you've gotten this too. As you go to events, you almost always get a survey. Like they want your feedback. How That's was the event? Yeah. How was your sales? Because if you as an artist are not happy with your sales and how the setup was and how loaded and load out was like, uh -huh. you're not going to come back. Well, that affects them. And their jurying process, right? Because they're gonna have fewer people coming in, maybe lower quality coming in over the yeah. years if everyone's unhappy every time. How often so, do you get asked how your sales were? I feel like I almost never get asked that from a show. I feel like it's almost always like a scale. When someone asks, it's almost always a scale that I'm presenting. Yeah, with. a scale of like an actual like, dollar figure. No, no, no. Like happiness. A dollar figure for, oh, happiness. Yeah, okay. like, are you happy with how your sales were? Okay. Or were they like, was it what you expected? Yes, no, maybe, kind of. Okay. 
you know, were you happy with it? Like very satisfied to like very exactly. dissatisfied, yes. one to yeah. five sort of thing. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like you're trying to get into the pool to get into the show, but then you're like, do I? And you kind of want to present it the way that you applied with so that it matches what you're showing. Right. And then I worried that like, well, what if I like only show my best things for this jury thing? But I don't necessarily, that's only like three pieces of what I actually have in my booth. Yeah. And most and, of the bread and butter stuff is what sells. So it's like, you know. Yeah. And sometimes it's not necessarily like, I mean, you want your best work, but again, it goes back to like what presents best in your photographs, right? Mm -hmm. It's not your best work. And making it cohesive, right? Because if your best work is like three different glazes, three completely different forms, it does not look cohesive. And yeah. so now they're like, and they're going to see your booth shot too, but those three images are the big images on the screen. Your booth shot is being projected on a screen uh -huh. the exact same size. And if you think about your booth shot, you have to show, for example, all three walls on your booth shot. A lot of times if <laughs> I made this mistake, zoomed in slightly and I, you couldn't see the front leg of this wall it was just like you could see these three and like that you cuts me the out leg. like the tent legs to yeah. see that it's all four and so because you can see that tent leg it makes you think like oh what's over here that i'm not seeing right that you're not realizing they thought maybe you crop, it, it cropped cropped in you thought that you cropped something out right but... even though it was like a matter of maybe six inches and i was just like god damn it yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had one that I submitted, and I had my booth sign in the back of the booth, and they were like, you need to submit it without the sign on At it. At least they I, let I didn't you even know. think about it, like, but then they said, like, yeah, so I just yeah. put, like, a white square on yeah. that. Because when, when you're looking at those bigger shows that are, you know, there's 500 people applying, and there's 200 spots, like, those are things, they're not going to reach back out to you. They see it, that's an automatic no, because they mm -hmm. know they have so many to go through. Yeah. So it's those, like... Yeah, they must and have if you do it, have a table, the table lost, they'll hit it home. No wrinkles. Iron it all out for your phone. Which is not realistic in real life, right? Like you fold it up in your little box and shove I've it in your car. I've never heard that. But like oh I my God, yeah. That's, that's huge. Totally no that's wrinkles. huge. Your tent walls, no wrinkles. Your tablecloths, no oh wrinkles. My. If you're going to have it, get that stuff out of there. You photograph it. Set so it you up. Think, so you think that's a... You think that's like the 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 standard? Oh, yeah. The, the, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's stuff that, like, it's it's the small details that matter. Because, again, you're having seconds to catch someone's attention uh -huh. and stand out amongst 500 other. Like, yeah. it, like imagine you're the last category. Like, sometimes maybe it's all done in a day. Sometimes maybe it's done in two days. But imagine you're that last category. And there are 400 applicants in. Mm -hmm. And you have four images, five images per applicant. You know how tired they are of looking at yeah. those screens, and they're just like, yeah. "Oh, that doesn't look great." Next, yeah. like you're you're it. trying yeah. to make yourself stand out, and while it sounds so ridiculous, the same thing's happening in person at a show. People are just trolling by, and if you mm -hmm. don't yeah, have something that catches their attention right away to draw them into your booth, that's mm -hmm. a missed opportunity. So, right. in a way, they're trying to like prepare you for that too. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, I did get feedback from one show recently. I talked about it on the podcast, but it was like, they did give me feedback and I was like, yeah, yeah. but I'm like, what, you know, what, what's the next, like, you know, booth changes that, is it like the booth? Is it the photos of the items? And then I'm like, you know, the items, maybe the background. And then my background's got little, little marks on the gradient background. And I'm like, oh, do I need to like get another one? And then, how, so how do you yeah. do that? You talked about yeah, something yeah, you yeah. do digitally instead. Yeah, so I just photograph that, uh, Photoshop that in. So if you don't have Photoshop, it kind of stinks to do. But there's, I'm sure so many of the phones have the ability to kind of remove the background and, and drop stuff in. But, so I will take, uh, and, and again, I'm not an amazing photographer. <laughs> it's probably a little on my list, but after seeing tons of images, you learn and direct lighting from the side, not direct lighting. Natural light's always the best if you can. So like you can set up next to a window and and I have a um, on a sunny day, overcast day. Depends on how it much, depends, depends on how much window, reflection right? into yeah, where you're at on the house. So like mine Your when I do it, I'm flat, on the so Yeah. So well and of course <laughs> what I'm in terms of my jewelry is probably the harder hardest thing to photograph because it's small, it's shiny with the gold. And it's also shiny because of the glaze. So have, trying to not have hot spots, trying to not have reflections in the gold or the glass. And 
trying to get my camera close enough to focus and have it all in focus because like if I get close, it's out of focus. If I come back, then it's tiny, but zooming in yeah. reduces so the focus. So do you have quality. to use the manual focus instead of auto focus or something? So like or? if I on an actual camera is ideal, but I'm cheap and still use my phone. So it's just oh, like okay. <laughs> we make it work, it makes do. It's fine. Yeah. But like ideally, yeah, you have an actual camera that can you can set your um depth, depth of field. Focus. Yeah. yeah. F-stop, right? Oh, F-stop. So then what do you do second. digitally? You put it in Photoshop? And yeah, and so there's or... a, depending on what version you have. So mine, it's just a fancy, like, remove background. Great, which adds a layer mask onto your photo. Uh -huh. And then I just use uh, the paint bucket tool gradient, black to white. So that way I can drag it, because, like, some of my pieces are black, some of them are white. So I can adjust where that middle gray tone is based on mm -hmm. whatever the piece is to make it pop more. Um and then, like, and can you, know, you see the base of the thing, or is is your are your because your earrings are hanging off of something? Yeah, so right? I have I <laughs> I built like it's a piece of wood with two like L brackets for shelves screwed in and fishing line run across. So I'll hang my earrings off of the fishing line, so the the fishing line disappears so into the like background, just floating. floating. Yes, and so like in the gosh, it's a whole thing. Like, but in the jewelry section, you have like they're floating, and then you if. <laughs> If you're doing, and so many of these things are Photoshop, it's ridiculous, but like creating drop shadows below it so it looks like there's a floor below it to give you like a, so, like a sense of scale because you have no right, idea. You can't, you're it was just hold your hand floating. out there with the, with right. the earrings on your hand. <laughs> right, and, and then you also can't have, they can't be in your ear for these photographs, right? Because it's supposed to be a blind jury process. You're not supposed to know anything about the maker. Right. So it's like you can't have so like realistic. Skin tone and there'd be like in the same know, way the with like, like your ceramics, right? You're not submitting a picture of your mugs with coffee or tea in them, right? Even yeah. though that's maybe how they sell best, like on Etsy, is having yeah. real life photographs. Have like a scenery, yeah. But having those like lifestyle photo, yeah, I guess that's very camera and fun lenses. But yeah, so I just remove the background, throw in the. Um, Throw in the gradient, and then I can use like the paintbrush tool to kind of change that layer mask that I was talking about. So like, if it cut out some of the earring, bring it back, or if it's not close mm -hmm. enough, you know, erase some of that, and so then it's there. So what's your actual background that you're able to crop it out? Is it um, I do like a gray. It's a gray. Like I bought. Um, I have a light booth, and it came with like these inserts, and so one of them is a nice medium tone gray. And I just do. It okay, on that. so it's contrasting enough that you can select it, and it's gonna right crop. Evenly across the board. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And it has so, that nice natural light. So how long have you been doing more of that? Have you been tweaking that more lately? More recently, or, okay. yeah. So we didn't kind of talk about it. So I did all that arts and administration. 2021, halfway through is when I officially started my business. Beginning of 2022 is when I left my full-time job doing arts administration to do this full-time. So it's a fairly new yeah. <laughs> adventure for me. Um, 2022, I did a fair amount of shows. I couldn't even tell you how many because it's too many. But I was applying with a really terrible bootstrap that didn't have, I didn't have like sidewalls up in my booth. Like, oh, the before and after. I didn't have sidewalls. <laughs> I don't have sidewalls in my booth. Oh, you can have your sidewalls up, man. But it's not, it's too dark though. Uh, okay, so sidewalls. Yeah. And like, how close are you? Because I'm like, yes. do you get the, 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 the edge of the white top into the yes, legs and, and the that's legs it. and then show show the bottom of the legs you have to show that frame so okay. that way you have an idea of what your entire tent looks like okay and see i think mine is too far back okay you can see like half of the top oh yeah no no no, no. i need to get closer so it's you can actually see what mm -hmm. what you can visualize on my table and stuff yeah and then i'll be able to get the hanging mug and stuff okay yeah okay so 2022 so a whole year of shows for tw so I had For half of twenty so I had half twenty twenty one, all of twenty twenty two, and um, there were a couple of decent shows, but mainly smaller, like just kind of smaller markets, a few juried shows, mm -hmm. but not a ton. And were they all around indie? Yeah, much? there was a couple. Like I did a couple in Evansville, a couple up in Fort Wayne. I did so I traveled a little bit, but not really more than like two or three hours. And so this year was the first time I was like, all right, I finally have, because I did those shows and finally got a decent booth shot when I was set up. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I got, what, at the time, I'm like, I got a decent booth shot. I'll get some good photos of my earrings. I'm going to try for the bigger shows that are, you know, higher booth fees, higher application fees through Zap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for the first few, 
I didn't do the gradient background, right? Okay. First few. So the you first, were like, able two to... or three. and Because I had okay. applied for a couple shows in, I think, and early Just the early applying March. portion, not even, like, just finding out if you got in or not yet. Yeah, I had applied with some of those, and I was like, I really need to do this. I'm going to take the time to do it. And I did it. And those first few applications <laughs> versus having the gradient background was the difference of being waitlisted versus accepted to these big shows, which is wild, but it was the difference. What? <laughs> so gradient background. Yeah. And before it was just the gray? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. And you didn't, did you even touch it in Photoshop or anything no. like that? Okay. No. So, but, so it was, I mean, you imagine still just these float of, floating earrings with a gray background. So it's still a nice contrast. It still has that side mm -hmm. light. Um, I just wasn't photoshopping in that great no, background. None of us want to hear that. I'm like <laughs> sinking for into this chair hearing it. But. <sighs> right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great background. So those three shows, and did you, were there shows that you didn't get accepted into the first year that you applied, or was it like yeah, so, you were just pushing to try to yeah, get yourself out of the comfort zone? Yeah, so I year? did in 2022. There was one where I was like, this is a good size show that was jury um, in Indiana, uh, Point on the lake. I had applied to in 2022 and got waitlisted. I was like, dang it. Applied again with a green background, got accepted right away. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a good show. See, I wonder. Yeah. Well, I guess if you said the jurors, it's subjective each year because the jurors change. probably change. Yeah. So it's not that like, oh, we saw her last year. Mm -hmm. We saw this artist last year. So let's yeah. let's give them a try this year or something. Yeah. Or, yeah, and you never know who applied last year that didn't apply this year that might be trying out a different show because mm -hmm. we all do that. We go through cycles of like, yeah, I did this show. It was okay. Maybe I'll try this other one that I heard about that's the same weekend and see how it goes. Yeah. How much is it? Did you do any of like looking at the vendor list from that year that you didn't get in and like look and compare no. to other? I've not actually. I didn't look at any of that. Okay. At all. I sometimes have done that just to like see what other potters have done. It helps me like give a little more credibility to the show if I, like, look yes. at the potters that are in it and, like, see if there's names that I'm familiar with or, like, if I could go to their business page or whatever and, like, see what kind of work they make. I can kind of fit myself in there. Am I, like, close? Do right. I think that I would sell? I more care about can I sell well. I'm not thinking, like, can I get in or not? But, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty objective to be, like, am I actually going to get in or what, you know? Yeah. No, and, like, if there's a show that you want, like, because that was kind of where I started in... 2022 was like looking at all these shows and it's like for example I know like I was like oh I think this sounds like a fun one and and that year I had looked at some of the artists that were on it I'm like yeah this is a nice sh that was how like I guess that's how I gauge if I think it's a nice show and a worthwhile show mm -hmm. is like you said looking at the artists that are in there looking at their Instagrams their websites if they're around just googling them yeah. but like I did not compare last year to this year to see who was there yeah but it's definitely worth doing if you're interested in the show and if it's people that are like okay they do this for a living like there's not a reason they would have this on their calendar a lot of people that like have this on their calendar and keep doing it right if you know they're they're not doing well right know? yeah i mean there's I like they will legitimize it a little bit more yeah and once you make start going to shows too and make friends with people that are like you're like man this is where i want to be and like looking at what shows that they're doing and asking them how they did at these shows and like all right, I'm going to try and work out to do that show and see how it goes. I mean, mm -hmm. take it with a grain of salt because everyone, like, you can do the same exact medium and it can look completely different. So mm -hmm. that's tough. But it's a good way to gauge of, like, do you have a similar style? Is it even the same medium? Like, for example, at the show this weekend, there are so many jewelers, but they're all so very different. And, like, mm -hmm. a lot of times when you go to the fine art show, you see a lot of, like, silver work and gold work stone work like you talked about but like that I feel like it's not the case of the show we're at this weekend it's a lot of beaded crafted there are some stone pieces but it's it's more like um untraditional materials I would say so it's very different okay um do you feel like there's a is there an openness with the fellow jewelers to share a little bit or is it a little more tight I've not tried. I think or... I'm kind of intimidated. So a lot of the jewelers, and this, like, throws me I didn't talk about this, but they, like I said, they, you have your work in those glass cases, and it's very retail, and a lot of times it feels very cold. And walking by, if there's no one in their booth, I'm like, oh, I don't want to go talk to them. They're all by themselves. I like, think the ones that I see are, like, they're using the back. 
I don't know if that's it's a common jeweler all, it thing. It is. It is. These shows, at least this year that I've been, not that I get to walk around very much because I've been doing a lot. Last year, <laughs> Brandon came and helped me, and this year he's like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> See you later. You're on your feet. Right. <laughs> so it's like I can't really leave my booth, but sometimes like during setup, I'll get to walk by and like see people setting up. Uh-huh. their Because I've been trying to figure out my display. So I'm like, hi, well, I'm like, well, you got me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But that's, I don't, I have a little four door hatchback, and I'm like, I can't have big old displays. Yeah, you can't have cases, pro panels, like, and, or pro. Like... I got, I got some free pro panels from someone. I'm like, oh, this will make a great like back of my booth wall because it actually fits the color scheme for my rebrand and then I I wasn't thinking I picked him up in Brandon's old tour runner and I got home I'm like just don't fit in my car dang it <laughs> you probably don't have a roof rack to strap him to mm-hmm. so now I just have these pro panels sitting in my house oh, I'm like gosh. maybe one day I'll have a car big enough for him but not yeah. right now <laughs> you would think pro panels they would like come well I guess it looks cleaner being solid so they're not like folding a lot yeah. and Okay. It's just so silly. I don't want to see carpet. <laughs> okay. So you haven't talked with too many of the other jewelers and stuff at shows? No. Mainly other ceramic artists. Um, but yeah. There's, uh, Are there jewelers that come over that, like, engage with your stuff and they're like, oh, this is ceramic? Or do they understand? Or? Sometimes. When it's a slow show, yes. I do more of that going to see their work and they see more of mine. Um so I guess there's there's some, but I feel like it's never at the high end shows that I've been able to stop and have mm-hmm. these conversations with other jewelers. Um, and again, it's mainly because like they're setting up at the beginning or tearing down at the end, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay. And it's ready. interesting because you would you probably share more in common with people that work in ceramics than you do, do with jewelers, but your medium is jewelry and in art show terms. So right. it's like, yeah, the info that you want to know for the business side of it is from them probably for the shows, but want to know techniques and stuff from right. other ceramic people so it's, yeah it's funny because the amount of people that i'll have come over in like just people into the booth i'm like what even other ceramic artists right I'm like what is this is this clay and like yeah and they're like porcelain I'm like no stoneware man I'm like it's so light <laughs> and i'm yeah. like i know right it's fun and they're like so that's luster i'm like yeah that's great and like yeah. a lot of people think it's enamel because they're used to seeing enamel jewelry. I'm like, no, it's all Or the, like, polymer clay jewelry mm-hmm. and stuff. It's well, like... and a lot of people are confused because polymer is not usually... It, it's Sometimes people will put resin and make it shiny, but it's not shiny, and it's definitely not to the extent that glaze is on a ceramic piece. Right. So, it's more like just is... matte colors and, like, bright matte colors. Mm-hmm. and Like, they're fun shapes and very, like... I feel like more modern, but, like, kind of... Kind of... I don't know the right word, the right adjective for it, but it's kind of, like... A little more organic and I don't know. It's kind of stuff that like Rachel would wear that's like fun and bright. And, yeah. Like And it's okay to go through like um not seasons but like fads or trends with the yeah, shape. They're, or they're the trend, color. I guess they're kinda of trendy yeah. too. Yeah. Um and then they're also probably more affordable in that. I don't know if it's right. because they don't have to do the firing and all yes. that and the, the time it's just but they just look so intricate and like so um like very fine-tuned as well with like oh, the yeah. shapes and stuff they do yeah so the, uh and even to the extent some of what i do like it's done with basically miniature cookie cutters right you have in their case it's a really thin polymer slab in my case it's a clay slab um and they're cutting it out with little cookie cutters mm-hmm. and to get the basic shape and then they're they're not usually doing anything else other than cleaning up the edges to make it look clean and, and kind of refining the look mm-hmm. of the actual clay once it's been cooked whereas mine i'm carving into the clay i'm adding to the clay i'm glazing both sides i'm lustering wait they're both sides are glazed oh, yeah wow. yeah you've not seen them up close I, i've seen the fronts but i didn't yeah, know the yeah, backs yeah. Okay. so i use high fire wire and i suspend all of them in the kiln so that both sides are glazed so um okay. and then like when i do my pendants on my necklaces i'm carving the designs on both sides that way if you wear it and it flips around you still see the design as yeah. it moves and so otherwise it's like oh it's just flat clay <laughs> right side. so it's like oh well i don't want to stick into the kiln shell but yeah. you got the wire okay yeah okay so so did 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 you just kind of like grow to get to doing that to do it yeah. fully or what and or was it comments from people or why are they not glazed or no none of that it's my own it's I'm, just aesthetic <laughs> it's my own like 
attention to detail, I guess, because yeah. you're just like, man, it's not finished. It could be. Why is it not finished? Uh-huh. And that's, I mean, that's half of it, so. I yeah. Mean, basically half of Especially it. Especially if you have, like, these are smaller, but they're, gosh, I had one lady from a show, she's like, I love big earrings, and I was like, well, how big do you want it? She's like, I want a three-inch earring. I'm like, you know that's going to be kind of heavy, right? She's like, your earrings are light. They're be fine. And I'm like, because she's used to wearing so heavy earrings. I'm like, okay. And so yeah. imagine like three inches of, or it just her, moves around when she her, moves her head yeah. and you see this big clay back. And she's like, oh. And I sent it to her. She loves them. And she's like, they're not heavy at all. I'm like, great. I'm glad yeah. you're happy. <laughs> some, they could be colored with like underglaze or mm-hmm. slip or something. And yeah. it would be like, okay, being matte if you didn't really right. want the glaze. And it would probably be okay. And there's plenty. I mean, so once I started doing um, the ceramic jewelry and kind of like when I was working on my website, trying to see if other ceramic artists are out there and what their websites look like and how it, how it works. I found a handful, not very many, but I did find some artists that um, they don't glaze any of it. It's the raw clay, but they use the mason stains to color the clay, and so that's how they get their different colors. So uh, then it looks the same on both sides. Porcelains and- but to me, then it's like, okay, this kind of looks, it's starting to get into that realm of the polymer clay. Right, but it just has a little matte, more. Much, right, so. but it just has a little more dimension to it because you can mold and manipulate re- regular clay more than polymer clay. Mm-hmm. And then they probably don't understand that. Oh, this is just regular clay, but it doesn't. The customer doesn't really look any different. Yeah, they have no idea. Okay, so then are there a lot of people that just don't know what it is? Or is oh, that the, yeah, is that the jewelers you were talking about? That no, or no. that's just regular. Well, jewelers. Too, some of the jewelers that would come in too. Um, like there was one I did a show in Toledo, Ohio. And I, she did silversmith work, and I had gone over and was talking with her because it was so it was so slow. And I talked to her for like thirty minutes, and she came over and talked to me for like thirty minutes. And she was like, "Man, I've been doing this for twenty five years. I have never seen jewelry that looks like this. This is new, man." I was like, "Yes, <laughs> something new." Nice. And that is a comment I get all the time. People are like, "What is this? I've never seen anything like this before." Which was when I was doing my sculptures. That's why I went that direction because I was like, yeah, and, you know, people know mm-hmm. what a bowl looks like and what a mug looks like. I want to show you that clay can do something that you've never seen before. Yeah. But it takes me 18 hours to make one, so let's not take this to a show and have a kid knock it over. Right. <laughs> like, Plus, it's like, what's the market for this versus jewelry? It's right. like the market is, yeah, like, in the price point is affordable. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so did the um. The jewelry, how do you how do you feel about the like the the market for it? Because it pretty much only caters to like half of the population generally. You would it's, at shows, or is it like? Right. It, I mean, it is lucrative because there's so many people that buy them that like are they just gonna buy one set, or they're like I can't get another set. Like, you know, I am so one. I'm biased because I love jewelry myself. Like I said, I did all the other actual like mm-hmm. metal work. Um, but even I go to shows, and I'm like, I want to buy more jewelry, <laughs> and yeah. I get stuff. But the amount of people that lose something and come back because they lost one, mm-hmm. um, or it doesn't go with their outfit, or you have returning customers that just love it, and they're like, this has become my everyday earring. I want to get more. And yeah. then you have people, like there's one customer that came up to my booth, and she's like, I had a fun fact. I was in a wedding party, and I had to come up with something. And everyone's like, you love earrings. How many earrings do you have? She's like, so I counted them. I had over 300 pairs of earrings. And oh I'm like, my gosh. I mean, I got that many sitting right here under my booth, but dang. So <laughs> like, she was getting them as gifts for the wedding party? or No, she, she just, just had to have a fun pack. Like, everyone that was in the wedding party had to have a fun fact about themselves oh, to, like, okay. announce themselves, and that was hers. So you have people like her that, that they don't care how many they have. They love buying jewelry. And then you have mm-hmm. people that are, like, they want something new that goes with their outfit or, like, Right. Everything I make is hypoallergenic. There's plenty of people that have bought jewelry that they can't wear. I'm like, hey. mm-hmm. and so they try it out, and then they come back when they realize, oh my god, I can't actually wear these yeah. and buy more. And then you have husbands who come in and buy gifts for their nieces or their wife or their sister or their aunt or their grandma or their mom. It's like, what's the risk in buying? And then I have men who buy it too, like this amount or whatever. Yeah. Because yeah. and and when I talk about you know, it is cold, it is hypoallergenic, here's how I make it, then it's like talking to people about the process. Yeah, I'm sure you see it with your stuff, too. They're like, oh, my gosh, like, everything that's involved in this, like, yeah, it's totally worth this. Like, this is too cheap, right. you know? So, as Becca tells you all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Price it up. Price it up. Right. Okay. 
So how is the art shows going? Been going this year so far? Because you apply. How many did you apply to? Did you like get into the most of the ones you wanted? Not get into yeah. the, some of the ones you wanted. So I have no idea how many I applied to. To be perfectly honest, I would say percentage. <clears throat> so I've only got flat out denied to one, but I would say I was accepted into sixty five percent roughly, and then waitlisted for the rest. So for me, I was like, I mean, that's significant mm -hmm. compared yeah. to last year. <laughs> like, yeah. it was a night and day improvement over last year where I was flat out denied or waitlisted because of the quality yeah. of my photos and my food shop. Yeah. Um, and the sales have, sh it for these, because they're obviously more art events. They're not like arts and crafts or, or the um, art music festivals. They're like purely art and maybe the demonstrations where the music is kind of a side to the art. Add on to it, yeah. Right, whereas before the draw was the music or whatever was happening. Um, and the sales have reflected that difference too this year. Yeah, like the great. ones that you, I think Becca was talking about, y'all did one of the music thing and she, there was like four of you all there. I think, or maybe it's it was a, maybe it was another one that she said the art art in the park or art in the square. Oh yeah, in did. Bloomington, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then did you do one at a music thing where Becca was kind of about the music and you were in like the middle? Yes, yeah, it was awesome, Bloomington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. And so those both of those events all had tons of jewelry people, um, and yeah, no, they were great. And so one of those, okay, so one was called the Handmade Market, and so that one I'd say is more crafty, more like. I want to say there was some soaps and things like that, as well as jewelry and, and drawing, like 2D. Um, whereas the art fair on the square, it was a zap juried application that had more like higher end, yeah. like sculptures and jewelry and 2D. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like, it's why, so I remember, it blows my mind, like the, the handmade market, while it's a crappy thing, like, so it's a one day, the summer one is a one day event. And we still did really well, like, I want to say push, I pushed like fifteen or $1,600 for the one day, and it was like... So it was like 10 to 4 or something? Yeah, it was you like... You could have went to 6 or something like that. Yeah, and it was one of those, after. like, I, yeah, there was a, an event after, and she did, she was up near the music, and apparently that was the spot to be, which it was, because I just was really slowly tearing down. I sold like four necklaces and three earrings while I was slowly... So Tearing down because all the other vendors yeah. are like, we're out, we're done, and like, and they pack it up in like ten minutes. And yeah, like, and they're oh. out, and I'm just like, do you not see this mass of people like on their way to the like music festival that's at the end? And right, and so she stayed late too and did more sales. And I know there was another a jewelry artist who did polymer clay, and she did phenomenal, like a couple thousand dollars. Wow, and I'm just like. What? <laughs> At least the jewelry too. They can just put that in their pocket. Mm, it's like, small enough. I don't want to carry this around. around. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. And then like the art fair on the square comments. was also like a day event, and that one was um, a couple thousand dollars for the day. So it was it was a good event too. Okay. So are you are you how are you determining like which ones you want to do or not do? Are you trying to go that high end route because you're trying to get just more bang for your buck in a weekend? Yeah. So I'm trying to do what I've kind of decided I want to do, at least looking into 2024, which is wild to say. I want to do larger, fewer shows because I make, in terms of time and money made, I can spend less time physically there and make the same amount or more for an event. Whereas if I'm doing these smaller events every weekend, it's eating away my time and my weekends. And like, yes, I finally made that money, but it took me so long to make. Whereas I can do like yeah. two really big ones here. And if I can do some consignment and wholesale at boutiques and I can, you know, have some stuff online selling, like that'd be great. Because yeah. realistically, you're talking January through really until May. There's not a whole lot happening, mm -hmm. at least up here. I mean, you go down. Yeah, there's not. I don't really think it's worth it for me to do a show until May. Yeah, it's really. Maybe and, the last weekend in April. But. Yeah, unless you're going down to Florida or Georgia, going out to California, New Mexico, all that stuff. Like, it's, and then you have to spend the money to get there. And it's like, I have friends and family in Florida, but I still have to drive 14, 16 hours to And get then there. whatever else you got to take with you, and that car's packed. And, and you got to, like, yeah. It's yeah, just, it's a lot. So if you can do, and that was kind of my hope, like leaning into it this year, we'll see how it goes. Cause like the, the beginning of this year, I did some consulting work to, for the first part of the year. And I also have plain houses on the side. Mm -hmm. 
but between doing so, I'm making so much more now that I feel all these big shows are selling a lot more and the cleaning, my hands are going numb all the time. So end of July, I'm actually no longer going to be cleaning. Um, and the consulting, like the contract for what I'm doing is up at December. So I'm looking yeah. at the beginning of next year, like, oh dear God, <laughs> we got to make enough now to set aside. Cause that's realistically when the most money goes out the door, applying, paying the application fees, the booth fees, booking year, hotels right? and... What's that? that is the beginning of the year, right? Like mm -hmm. right in that Q1 yeah. before, I mean, when you're not doing shows. Right. Time, so. so much. Sorry. I thought that was a cat meow. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I thought I turned it off. Like that. That's all right. Okay, so you're going to do, so so you're kind of in sampling phase sort of still. Right, Like last yeah. year was sampling a little bit. This year you're, you're, you're expanding, you're figuring out the, the booth shots that how to get yeah. in how to, like know, I saw you it might want to yeah. leave aside. you're trying to improve the booth a little bit yeah yeah like I mean I saw so much of that when I was at the arts council and then you know going as someone who likes to go to art fairs and things like that and seeing what things look like but until you're actually doing it you don't know and learning who your audience is and what they want and what's yeah. ideal and what you need to get to where you want to be you know it's it's yeah. ever evolving and it's hard to just like ask somebody and, and there's probably not a lot of people that are just so close to what you do right? and what you make that it's like, it would easily translate that it's like, Oh, you should do this show. But it's also like your personality. How do you talk to the people at the show? And like, it's like one of your price part, points right? and Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So it definitely factors in. And it's like, it is kind of a crapshoot at the end of the day. Like you sampling 50 shows in two years is like, yeah. Probably. I mean, are there shows that you did this year so far that you're like, okay, I'm definitely going to do that next year? And then yeah, there's majority, like, okay, yeah, there's ones I'm just going to part ways with. You or, know, there have, it's kind of crazy to say, so far this year, there's only been one that I'm like, yeah, not doing that again next year. Mm -hmm. Out of X. <laughs> Even the smaller ones, like the the handmade market and stuff? Well, that's Bloomington, yeah. so that's what, it's, like, I mean, it's 45 close. minutes from you or yeah. 30 minutes it's from It's like, you. A, it's an hour from me, but the booth fee was like, a hundred something like it was a reasonable booth it was all day and it made like two thousand dollars almost so why not <laughs> like right. that's you know yeah. you can't for that amount of time invested that's great um and who knows maybe five years it'll be different but when you're trying to make a living at it like i can do that or i can do a farmer's market and make a couple hundred dollars like and it's only one or two hours less why would i not do this instead yeah how do you like the farmer's markets because you've been doing those yeah. with uh, did you commit for a period of the year, or did you do it? Or are you doing the whole season? Because yeah. Becca and you were sharing, we're kind of doing it at the same time. So I've done a variety of them. So, um, where the one that Becca and I do is like less than a mile from my house, and it's on oh, a Thursday wow. <laughs> afternoon. So it's like, how can I not do this in my own backyard? Yeah. And it's dirt cheap. So it's like I have a local community there, and at the time. Um, where they hold the farmer's market, they just built like a new cultural campus, and I was helping them kind of get their – they opened a new ceramic studio, so I, like, helped them get it up and running and showed them how to fire the kiln and showed uh, them how to empty the clay traps. Is that the one Becca's helping with, too, or is that a different one? No. That's a different one. Yeah, that's right something there. different. Um, so I was doing all of that and teaching classes, and that would have been, God, that was, that was only last year. Yeah. <laughs> and I, so the beginning of this year, I was like, I can't keep, can't keep doing this, so they have uh -huh. someone else who's helping them do classes, and they're still looking for every studio around town at this point, from what I've heard, is still looking for more people to help classes um because yeah i've had five different people that are like do you want to teach I'm like no <laughs> i can't i've learned my lesson i like helping people and teaching people but i've learned there's certain personality types that i don't yeah do for me it's just like <laughs> yeah like i could do it but I don't, I don't want to do the curriculum side i don't really want to do the i i just don't do that like i can do a class and make like a hundred bucks for a night for two and a half hours but it's like like that I doesn't really that doesn't really that. fulfill me at all like i don't yeah I would much rather do my own thing and maybe sell a little, I don't know. Yeah. Just like, the enjoyment level for me is more like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. It's funny because when I was in Ohio, after I graduated, I had nowhere to go make my work. There was a local play studio, so I went over and like was like, can I sign up for a class so I can make stuff? And after the first class, they're like, you don't need me. I was like, no, I really don't, but I just I wanted I to, you know, read it. And I was going to pay you for it. And she's like, you can help me teach classes and have use of the studio. I'm like, okay, great. And so I did that, and I really enjoyed it there, but it, like uh -huh. you said, it, the responsibility wasn't on me. I came in as, like, a helper on date night, Friday night, wheel throwing and stuff yeah. like that. But once the responsibility is on you to, like, set the curriculum, fire the work, 
pug the clay, reclaim. It's just like, I Yeah, don't that just eats into your that. time and then, like, your energy for other things that you actually want to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And your hand, like, it's very hand intensive to be yeah. doing all that studio stuff. And even if it's yeah. just unloading and loading kilns and, like, all that time and energy adds up. It does. It's it like, does. I would much rather be doing this at my studio. Yeah. And I think from and your kind kilns of are a lot smaller. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I do, I have a big kiln for my sculptures and I have the baby kiln that I do for my jewelry. Yeah. And I've been tell, telling Becca, I'm like, I'm almost ready to get a second baby kiln because with doing the lustering and three firings, I'm like, I can have things going in and yeah. out simultaneously. And it runs off of the 120. I'm like, oh, so much, so Such much a nicer. baby kiln. <laughs> Those things aren't any cheaper though, are they? They're like, not. Like they're the like, cost of a kiln is still like what nine hundred bucks yeah. or something. Well, I mean, shoot, the big boy I got's like four grand. Like oh, the God. baby guys, he, I got him. He was nine hundred. Now they're up to like a thousand. And I, <laughs> so I have had to switch out the relay already once in the baby guy. And I bought. I've done the thermal couples a couple times. And I, so I went ahead and bought like a set of elements and all of that, so I'd be ready for it. And it was like. To get a whole new set of elements, relay, extra thermal couples. I still spent like a couple hundred dollars. I'm like, oh, dang nice. it, that was almost the cost of a new one. <laughs> Could have well, gotten a new well, one. Well, if uh, <laughs> if L&L steps up to get the 120 volt, I'm sure Becca will get one of those and then you can right? buy one of hers. There you go. So. Yeah. Because she's talked about that with them too, about trying to get them up and running. So. Yeah, well, she's still talking about like the solar kiln thing. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how far out they are from that, but maybe look at the 120 that actually goes up to, I guess, going to cone 10. Cone 10, yeah. So that it works. Are you firing a cone 10? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. but that was kind of the, like, if I get a second one and all I do is my biscuit and lustering, that thing will last forever. And if I just keep the other one for cone 6. Yeah. Like, Cause your does your luster what is that temperature? It's cone o, uh, o 018. O 018. Okay. Okay. Have you seen the um? I don't feel like I've. I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna <laughs> do an L and L ad. I don't know. Right. All right. L and L. I'll put this in here. L and L Genesis controller, and uh, that would probably be nice for luster firing. So you could pre-schedule it. Luster firing. You could do your bisque firing. You could do your glaze firing. Have you ever single fired on there? No, I've not. I wonder not. if you could do that. Like with the earrings, you could probably single fire it up to Yeah, glaze. you probably could. I mean, I don't I know guess how intricate is the glazing and stuff. Oh, like. yeah, mine's all hand painted. It's, some of them are easy, like single colors, but some of them have three, four colors on them. So it just depends. You have to paint three, four layers. and yeah. mm. I do two layers. Two we layers. cut out a lot of that. There's a lot of and blobs. Then you do it on the it. back, too, but mm-hmm. you hang them. I wonder if the wire still needs to. I wonder if the wire would be good on like a single fire, or you'd need to like, if it's good to like biscuit and like okay. get it in there before you go up to the next temperature. I don't know. Well, maybe. I, don't well, know. I could try it and let you know. Yeah, <laughs> I got Just enough stuff. I mean, if you would think the, the thickness of them, like they probably wouldn't blow up, right? I don't know. I've, like they're so small. But still, there's times that I'll make stuff. And put it in like literally thirty minutes after I finish making it. I hit it with a heat gun on the kiln shelf. I'm like, eh, in you go, fifteen minute preheat. Yeah, yeah. I See you like later. That, that shelf can be hot enough. You could like preheat it in the oven. And, like the the kiln <laughs> shelf is like, all right, let's get the gloves out and like, all right, it'll dry. Right. Yeah. So quickly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Kilns, hotkilns.com. <laughs> hotkilns.com. All right. Um, what else? What else? The firing. We so were talking the, about farmers markets. Farmers markets, yeah. We went in a circle, but so like that one, couple hundred dollars cheap. Can't not do it. It's right there. Yeah. What else are you doing on a Thursday afternoon? I did a couple farmers markets um, in northern Indiana, which I would say is kind of like the higher end of town. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're good. They're Saturday mornings. You make a couple hundred dollars. But to me, it's like it's competing with potentially doing these major art shows. So yeah. I kind of dropped. The, I did those in twenty twenty two. Drop them off and not doing them this year yeah. because I want to do more of those big art yeah. shows. But I, that being said, there are some farmers markets. I this year I'm driving down. It kind of like filled out my schedule. Farmers markets in Bloomington. I'll do like eight hundred bucks. And that's on like, like a weekday. Uh, it's on. It's on a Saturday morning. But oh, it's it like. Is. But you'll like you'll using it, it to around fill your other. Mm-hmm. Okay. Whereas, like, all the other one, like, even the one that's in my backyard, I had to commit for a half season or a full season. But the farmer's market yeah. that I'm doing down in Bloomington, it's once a month, and it's arts at the farmer's market. And it's from 8 to 1. And so you... 8 to 1, okay. And yeah, they have remember. it, like, once a month, May or October, and you can pick, like, do you want to do all of them? Do you want to do one of them? Do you want to do three of them? So, oh, okay. 
So they don't have the art every single every week. single week. Yeah. Okay. Just once a month. Yeah, they used to do that at the Covington. I do the Covington Farmers Market there in Northern Kentucky every now and then, and they used to do it like the third weekend of every month. We'd always do like guest and vendors and okay. And then they just changed it this year, so like I can basically just tell them which weekend. So nice. Yeah. So I'm only I'm only gonna do like four or five, but it is like a filler, and it's ten minutes from my house. Right. Nine to one. Like, and there's gotta I mean, be like that for yeah. everyone. You know, there's one and, in every town. So. Yeah, and I see the same people like customers over. And over and they're like you gonna be here next month or you know yeah good to and see they buy, you again. buy stuff from you too yeah. don't they some of them do and then some of them are just like they'll, they'll keep going and they get their produce and stuff okay. but but then they might get something the next time i see them so yeah. but there is a lot of them that'll be like oh are you here all season or when are you back and and it is a little bit like oh yeah i'll be back next month or i'll be back you know mm-hmm. next yeah. week and it's it gives them a little bit of like i get it, it gives them an out to be like okay i just made conversation like whatever right. Um, but it's also like frequency, I think does factor in somewhat oh, to 100%. some of that. Yeah. Um, cause they see you and then, I mean, I, I'm sure you probably have this too, like getting gifts for people and they'll be at the market and they're like, and they'll be looking at, Oh, what do you have new? And I'm yeah. like, and I'll, and then some, there's times where I mentioned like, Oh, Mother's Day is coming. And then we're talking a month out. Mother's Day is coming. I have to like, oh, I do need to get that. Like, uh-huh. and so you yeah. can, these people, because you see them all the time, you can, be like, oh, you know, whose birthday is coming up? Mm-hmm. You know, what holiday? Like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. And then they'll buy from you. Yeah, I feel so. like you can't, your business has to be sustainable, not on like just impulse buys. Like, right. you've got to be like, kind of in there, like, give them ideas. And even some people that are like, what do I use this for? And you're like, I don't know, whatever you want. Like, come up with like two or three things that tell yeah. them what they would use it for. Because it, it sparks their thing in their mind. And they're like, oh, yeah. Or, or what about this? And you're like, yeah, that too, that works. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that you you're being like, like salesman yeah. or something. And you're like trying to sell them on something that they don't want. It's just like, oh, just give me some ideas. If it sparks something, then like, sure, let's yeah. go with this. And then. And then you can tweak and be like, oh, what about this color? What do you think about this one? I mean, they're, they're going to spend their money somewhere. Why not spend it in their community with someone they see, see every day, yeah. right? Like, they can spend it with you and buy this, or they can yeah. go out and get some fast food, or they can go out and get a coffee. Yeah. You know, like. So how does your how does your show schedule fit with your partner that is, yeah. like, your weekends are very <laughs> tied up? Does he work weekends? Does he, yeah. is he cool with the... Yeah, because he's not going to the shows with you anymore. Right. right, at least not now. But so it it's changed over time. So he used to do like they. So he works in a car dealership and he works ridiculous like sixty to eighty hours a week, depending on the week. Um, so it used to be like he only had one weekend off a month. Now, more recently this year, That's it's like prime buying cars. <laughs> it's the weekend. I mean, well, he so he works in the service department, so people are coming in to be like, "Hey, this is broken. What happened?" <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, I can see there's probably backlogs of cars for car that parts kind of stuff with and, COVID. Yeah. You know, not coming in yeah. like stuff that sat forever. And text coming in now, yeah. so yeah, so that's its own world. But more recently, it, it's gone to like they have three weeks off one week on so like now he has the opportunity to come to more shows but it's like after working because he goes he's there at seven in the morning he's leaving at seven at night so after doing that monday through friday he's like i do not want to wake up early on saturday morning i'm like all right see you later so <laughs> like, one week on meaning he's only working one weekend a month uh now he is but now in the past okay. it used to be he was working three okay so like more recently it's changed yeah um and, like, he, when I went to Toledo, he came up with me. And so, like, he'll come to a few of them here and there. When I'm like, I really want you to come, he'll come. But for mm-hmm. the most part, I'm like, don't feel like you got to come. Like, hang out with the dogs. And do you want him to come in. just because it's a new show and you're just trying to get a feel for it? Or is it just, like, it would be a nice thing for us to, like, get away and, like, it make it a mini vacation plus. Yeah. So, like, this one, for example, that we're doing right now, I was like, this would be fun for a mini vacation. Um, but... I ended up having my mom come instead. So she lives in uh-huh. Tennessee. So it was like a nice in the middle for the two of us. Uh-huh. But like there's a couple of them um, that will be like um, uh, Chesterton, Indiana is up kind of near Chicago that I'll be doing a show up uh-huh. there. And so that's one I'm like, hey, let's have a mini vacation. Like go up on Thursday, come back on Monday, like take some time off work. Because he only has so much time he can take off on the. Because yeah. for the weekend shows, you're almost always setting up on Friday. Uh-huh. And then depending on how far away it is, it's Especially like. Drive. 
last thing you want to do after a weekend is like seven eight o'clock at night get in the car and drive three hours you know so yeah trying to turn it into like a mini vacation if i'm doing those far away ones yeah. And then sometimes it's like, I have a lot of friends at this show. Can you come so I can, so yeah. I can go wander around a little bit, go to the bathroom? Does and he home. does he like to talk with the customers and he stuff does. too? Or is it more like he's yeah, like he's, bare essentials? If he needs to like check yeah. people out, he will. He's like a he's, sweetheart. He's okay. an absolute sweetheart. So he talks with people all day at work. So I'm honestly surprised that he ever is like willing to come. So I'm like, you just talked for the last 12 hours. Okay. Like, why would you want to talk more? But it's a different interaction. People are always so excited when they come into uh-huh. the booth, whereas like his work, people are always upset they have when they come in. And issues, and they're like, "All right, right. give it to me. What's it going to cost me?" Right. So he's for like, him, it's a different interaction. Eighteen dollars. <laughs> right. Here. right? <laughs> um, and he's all about. He's got the square down. It, it's funny. He gets on me. So like, I have the square set up, so it'll prompt you if you would like to tip or not. When I'm checking someone out, I'm like, okay, so this is it. Yes, I because you have to turn it off, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna oh. turn it on, whatever. But it's on my phone, right? <laughs> and um, so I'll I'll check someone out, and I'll be like, okay, it's 18 even. You can tap or insert the card, and they'll take it out. And I'm like, okay, do you want a receipt? And they'll say it, and I'll change it. Him, he's like, okay, it'll be 18 even. You can tap or insert. He's like, and here's some questions on the screen for you. And he hands the phone to them. And I kid you not, this kid, people, people tip him left and right when he does it. Like, it's amazing, but I just feel so uncomfortable doing it. But a lot of people I found want to do it because they know there's a processing fee involved and they want to help you cover that and they appreciate oh. you. And like, because they're like, oh, I don't have cash. Like, I know you get charged a fee. Like, I've had people flat out ask me that. I'm like, yeah, it's 3%. Like, you know, it's, part, it's the cost of doing business on my end, but people right. want to help you out with that. Yeah. So, but he's all about like, no, it's questions on the screen for you. <laughs> he just hands it to him. <laughs> These are for me. Here you go. Okay. Um, that would feel so great. icky for me, but, but for it's me like, too, I feel right? it's so awkward whenever I see a screen that says tip and I see they like flip it around and they're like, all right, I'm going to look away. So that I'm would totally you. be me. Like, And then you're like, well, if I do custom, it's going to take longer and they're going to think I'm doing something or whatever. And then, I, and then they're going to see immediately when they flip it back, like how much it was. But I think I subconsciously think they judge, they judge it immediately, yeah. but they, uh, maybe they don't. I don't know. Yeah, they do the wills. Oh, and well. service is probably like an up and down. It's like averages. Like what is, or what do you make for the night? It's not like, okay, that individual, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's just okay. weird. I never turned it off, and he was, every time we do, if he does come to the show, he's like, no, you gotta give it to him. I'm like, no. So I how often do. does it, does, <laughs> do they give it to when oh, he does it? Oh, 80%. 80%. What? Oh, man. He's, what is it, like a buck or something? Uh, So it's always a they, percentage. It's so the same way do, as. It's like 15, 20, some, 25 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like oh if someone, for example, if someone buys a necklace here and so it's $94. Someone tips 15% on that, like, what? <laughs> you know, like. Okay. I mean, technically, you could be like, all right, it is kind of a service for you coming out here. So it's like, all right. I, mean, I don't know. People, are, I don't know. They people do just, what they want to do, really. Yeah, like, Yeah, if you want to. But again, free. that's what he does. That's why I'm always like, do you want a receipt? No? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I <laughs> turned that off, too. I, I turned that off, too. So yeah. I don't even have the signature, the receipt, the tip. I, it just processes it. And then occasionally somebody will be like, oh, uh, did, my, did I get a receipt? And then I'll be like, all right, let me go to the transaction and send a new receipt. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Every now and then, like, even, so I have the square where it's the tap or the insert, and, like, mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, but when they insert the card, it always wants them to sign. And so, like, then I'll be like, okay, once your signature and receipt, and it still has that tip on there. Oh, really? And sometimes people will do it then, and I'm like, I made it clear it was about a signature and receipt, so I Wait, so do you have the it. kiosk thing, or is it just on your phone? No, it's just on my phone. Okay. I want to get, I, I want to get the kiosk. I saw you had the stand for the... Didn't you, didn't you have the little, not the stink, but you had the little mount thing for the charging block for the dip and stuff? Yes. So it's actually yeah. like powered somehow? Or yeah, I have, yeah, yeah I have a little can. like power block that I keep it plugged into so it never goes to sleep. That way when they come in, oh, it's okay. never like, because I, I ran into like my blue, I don't know why. So I don't have Apple, I have Android. And I would run into it, All like, right. disconnecting when it would go to sleep. And then, like, someone would come yeah. in and want to buy something and try to start it back up. And that is frustrating. And I'm just, like, Plus, there's one button on it, and there's lights. So, it's, like, it doesn't give you any info if it's working. Yeah, if it's not working. Yeah. Um, do, they, do they have the tap on on there? The, mm-hmm. On the iPhone, they have it Oh, now, yeah. The and it's great. Phone. And doing the Apple Pay and all, like... Yeah. I remember the first time someone came up, like, I didn't know it took Apple Pay on it, yeah. on the little tap thing, because it's, like, I think $40 to buy it, and I was like, okay, it'll be whatever, and they just went, boop, and I was like, oh, 
Oh like, wait, can they actually tap on the, on their they, not, on not their from phone. their phone? But the, I have a thing on my yeah. screen now that says I Over, can like, tap the the card on my phone. I don't even need to oh, use that. Oh, gotcha. So that does exist. I've not used that because okay. I've had that. That one's super convenient. I don't even need to use the the chip reader anymore. Gotcha. Like, I think every single transaction today except one. It's been consistent for you. I used the tap. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the only reason is the guy had a chip, but he didn't have a tap. So. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what and it's I mean. Pretty yeah. easy. So I just have mine that sits out there, and and it's almost always the tap. But there's a lot of people that. Yeah. I think it's worth it to it. have like, that though. Like. That forty dollars is worth it. It's like forty or fifty bucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so totally worth it. it. Yeah, I can't. I when people. <laughs> when people like come you're on a flip phone. If you come with a swipe, you're like. Oh yeah. That one, that one's <laughs> rough. Um. No, the amount of people, like, especially doing farmer's markets and stuff like that, if you're doing it, 100% worth it. People will be, I, there's been events that people were jogging through, they live in the area, and they just stop by, and they're like, oh, I didn't bring my wallet, but they have their watch on. They're like, oh, do you take, pay, you know, Apple Pay, whatever pay? I'm like, yep, yeah. and they just tap with their watch, and off they go. I'm like, yeah. let's say I wouldn't have had it if I didn't have that, like, exactly. for myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, it's super good. They make it easier and easier. Like good for us, but like probably bad for them. Right. It's so easy. To, you have this disconnection of the money that's being spent, and it's just like I don't know how much I spent. Yeah. But uh, okay. All right. So next year shows, and then you'll like filter down a little bit. Yeah. And then there, again. there's some. Uh, I guess the timing. You'll figure out the timing for the shows that you didn't get in. Did you didn't get to apply to? Because you right. missed it. Exactly, yeah. So okay. I have those like on the calendar ready to go for this year yeah. to apply to. And then do you have like a radius that you try to do for like how far yes. you're willing to go? Yeah, I have decided my limit is three hours. Well, I, I lie because I just drove this three is, and a half for this one. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> this one wasn't that much. Not this including your turnaround, right? Yeah, yeah not, not the right. turnaround. The turnaround was an extra two okay. hours there. Back home. <laughs> she, she forgot something and had to turn around and go back home. Yeah, I was an hour into the drive. I was like, oh, no, I forgot my pole connectors for entertainment. <laughs> Time to oh, go back gosh. home. <laughs> yeah, you can't forget that. But at least it was an hour in and not when I was here trying to set up. So there's that. Okay. But no, I. so it's all personal preference. Like next year I'm looking at, I would really like to do, um, there's the, I think it's called American Craft is the organization and they are doing a craft show in Baltimore and it's in, I want to say March mm -hmm. and it's inside and it's a big, like high fine craft event. So like yeah. that's one I'm going to have fingers crossed to apply to to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the furthest I'd ever do, but really I think for me, three hours, like I'm not trying to go past Chicago. That's or, a good radius. I feel yeah. like three hours is drivable. Yeah. After that, it's like, Especially if you forget something. <laughs> like, yeah. You're stuck. Or if you, yeah, I feel like I've come to this one before and I didn't, like, I had a, it was, it was one of those early ones and it was a good Friday sales day and I was like, I should have brought more of this or, because you pack it all up and by the time you unload it onto the table and everything, it's like, man, all these bins are like not, they're not that much extra. Like, I feel like I brought way too much of certain things, but then I'm like, you know, I'm probably okay. Right. And then you figure it out, and you're like, okay, I need more of this next year, or more of that next year, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just chance it and risk. It. Like I, I had, I brought four business cards with me. That was the one thing I forgot. I forgot oh to bring no! More business cards. <laughs> so I have, I have more of the slips that have all my info. So okay. if people, and then I just put it down in my booth. If people can ask if they want, and yeah. I'll, yeah, I don't. don't. Some people are like, I don't even put business cards out because it's a waste of paper because people just throw it away. But I'm like, eh, we'll see if they ask me. I did have a couple people ask me, and I was like, shit, where are my business cards? Like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, damn, I forgot to get more. Or, Have you been I, ordering? I did. I did order them. Okay. I got like two thousand of them. Nice. So I, uh, I should just grab a box of them and just leave them in my car. Where to the wise? Order a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but when I first was starting shows, I was like, eh, I'll get five hundred. It'll be fine. Just, just go on out and get the two thousand. You'll go through them real fast, especially if you're putting one in every bag at an event that you yeah. sell. Like, you'll go through a couple hundred within a month or two. Like, yeah, and I still print the things. I print like, I print the full page. It's like a, it's a quarter of the page. Okay. So, it, but it's horizontally quartered. So it's like, mm 
-hmm. It's two images of my work on one side, and it's like basically my business card info on the other side. And mm -hmm. then I write a like, thank you for purchasing handmade. This is how I make it. Gotcha. Appreciate it, whatever, whatever. And then I fold it in half. Nice. And that's what I put in the bag. Nice. So the image should like put a little thing in their brain of like what the item was if they don't okay. remember. Yeah. Um, and then the card is really just on the table. So if people want to get that, they can pick it up. But yeah. But yeah, I ordered like two thousand yeah. after Becca hounded me for like three years, <laughs> and then uh, well, I was proven so that the price it, was actually right? reasonable. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, it's got to be like forty cents a piece, right. and it's like it was like ten cents a piece or whatever. Right, she's on me right now. Six Shout cents. out to Becca because, <laughs> because I cut all my earring display cards. She's like, I mean, you just need to order those. I'm like, I do. She's like, these aren't straight. I'm like, I know, <laughs> like because I'm hand cutting them. So oh right, yeah. Straight. And it's no different than ordering a business card, right? Just hand. Can you just get a business card with nothing on it? Yeah, sure. Or would you, I guess you'd put, you'd put something on it, right? Yeah, I'd probably, now that I've got, like, on the back. new branding, I'd put the logo and stuff on it, like, and it, because the other, so I hand cut all my cards, and then I have stickers that I um, print out the price, and, like, information about, like, it's gold filled, it's hypoallergenic, it's mm -hmm. gold luster, or white gold luster, and, like, all of that. And I put the stickers on the backs of all the cards to match with the price of the piece. Mm -hmm. So I could have all of that printed on the cards ahead of time and save. Yeah. I'm now that I'm doing so many more shows this year, I'm like, this is eating a lot of time. Like Yeah, I can see that. I and took then two if you don't have me and somebody else help cards you, last like night. Brandon doesn't want to be oh, cutting, no. cutting cards no, no, no. and <laughs> it wouldn't look straight and it would probably you know, you'd have them sitting on the ledge and it'd be like Mm -hmm. sideways and be like no that doesn't look right right and, the, and more recently so she <laughs> I've always used a hole punch to cut the little holes on I was wondering how you okay yeah so I've used a little hole punch and she's like what she came over to one day she's like do you want help I'm like yeah man and she's like what are you doing I'm like uh punching the card she's like no 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 and she goes out to the van she comes back with her drill and the tiniest drill bit one sixteenth that you've oh ever my gosh. seen she's like okay and she's, that is you got perfect <laughs> right I was like yeah, I got wood. Let me go get it. And so we're drilling the holes. Oh my god! So now, so perfect. I like went out and bought a new drill bit for my drill, and like I'm doing it that way. But this last go round, I was round, thinking about how you did that. This last go round, I did it by myself. And Ryan, I could not drill a straight hole to save my life, apparently, oh my <laughs> because god. by the t it was like I had stacked it like two inches high to drill. Oh god! And by the time I got to the bottom, it will it had shifted like a quarter of an oh inch god. over because I didn't so drill you it straight. I guess you can't. I guess when you get it printed, you're not gonna get. Are you gonna get like little bitty you like can. cross drawn on it so that you know you drill it in the same spot you can some, i mean depending on where you're buying stuff from you can get stuff punched as well like you can get stuff printed and punched and not do any oh, okay. of that and it costs more but like if you're doing high me and my mom were actually just talking about this today if you're doing higher end art shows stuff is not going in the crack because i use little brown craft paper bags mm -hmm. they're not going to go in that everything's going to go in a jewelry box it's a dollar per jewelry box like you have the added cost and and we're talking about the cards and changing this place. She's like, so if you're going to go this shift this direction, you're talking about everything needs to be upped by like $10. And which is at the end of the day, nothing. If my studs are uh -huh. 18 and now they're 28, I have stuff on consignment in a gallery and the earrings are already 28 there. Yeah. And how so, many boxes are you going to need and how much oh, space is God. the box is going to take? That was what I told her. Car. She's like, you'll be fine. I'm like, because they can't stack <laughs> inside each other. So the same size, right? I bought. Recently, I bought a carton of boxes. It was like it was from Uline. I want to say it was like two hundred jewelry boxes, and it came in a box that was so it was probably like two feet, or like maybe eight or nine inches by another eight or nine inches. So it's not it's not huge, but it's not small. Yeah, especially um, in that vehicle. Yeah. So like space. the space is a premium. Yeah. The premium, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> well, all stuff to consider. Okay. So, and how much of the, like, how would you break down the percentage of, like, show sales in your, like, grand scheme of, like, how much you're making? Is it, is it, like, more than 50% of your actual, like, income oh, yeah. for, yeah. Yeah. It's, versus online and then. So, like. Consignment and everything. Currently, currently I'd say in-person shows are probably around 60%. Cleanings probably around thirty, and then another ten between like online and consignment. Yeah. But shifting more. 
Do you wholesale I'm, some too, or just the combined? I have pulled, so I, I recently created the line sheet. I've wholesaled to one person so far, mm. um, but I got a linked for fair. My goal is like end of August to get wholesaling and fair going. Mm. Um, but I, I'd like to shift towards still doing 60% sales, but it being from the higher events, so fewer events, and then making up that remaining 40 from um, like wholesale and, and retail mm-hmm. and online sales. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. I Did haven't you... figured out what percentage of yeah. that breakout is going to be, but keeping the same ratio, but cutting out the cleaning and uh, consulting to replace it with like retail and wholesale yeah. like, in stores and online. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's fun to like see you go through the different, like, I feel like you've really been hitting it hard right. this year for sure. And, I mean, we haven't known each other that long, but it seems like you've been really, like, focusing on getting the, the shows going and, like, trying a bunch of different ones. Because I, right. I didn't even know you were in this until you were like, oh, I'll be there. Yeah. And then we're going to, you're doing Woodland. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested to see how you do at Woodland. Woodland's yeah. kind of a similar crowd to here, but it's in okay. Lexington, so it's, like, college town. But it's, like, it's well attended. There's a lot of families that come. Yeah, and I feel like because that, to, to me, Lexington feel, and I was telling my mom this today, like, the bigger metro, and this is just based on my audience, but the bigger metropolitan cities or very tourism-driven towns are what do well for me. Mm-hmm. And so I think Lexington will probably be a little bit better than Berea, just because it's not a big town. Even though it's very craft, similar to like in Indiana, Nashville is right next to Bloomington. It's very craft focused, and I've done shows there, and I've done well, but I do better in Bloomington. And there, yeah. we're talking fifteen minutes apart. Right. So a lot of the same people go to the same shows, but being in that metropolitan area for whatever reason, I do better there. Plus, the Lexington one, the usually the way they time it is, it's the weekend of moving for the University uh, of Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of families and people that come. That are moving their kids that. in. It's that is, that's why it's timed that way. I think another thing too to like ever consider if you can line up a show with like the week or two before graduation weekend for college, phenomenal in a college town. Which is usually like early May, <clears throat> so like April, beginning of May. May, like late April, beginning of May. Because really, there's no holidays happening at that time, so you don't think about it well, personally. Mother's Day. Well, May's uh, Mother's Day is later in May though. Yeah, it depends. It's been on it's my usually like time, 20th. Which is May 9th. Oh, okay. I it's been it's... as early as May 9th before, I is think. Is it really? I think it has been. Later. Okay, well, I'm bad at that stuff, I think so don't so. ask me. <laughs> but it, yeah, yeah. Early, I mean, early May is, yeah, you can definitely Mother's Day gifts for sure. Yeah. But yeah. But okay. yeah. Graduation. If yeah, if you're in, like, so Bloomington has a, a large college in it, or like if you're going up to Lafayette, Indiana, there are Purdue universities up there. So going to these <clears throat> large college towns. Like the weekend before or week of graduation, people are shopping left and right for last minute graduation gifts. Yeah, so and that's a good price Something point. They're like, okay, like I can get them earrings. They're gonna be happy with this or happy enough with it that they'll wear it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, I think we're about wrapping up here. Do you want to tell people about uh, what's your business name? How they can contact you? How they can find you? Yeah. So uh, if you find me on Instagram, Glazed Confused Creations, because ampersand doesn't work, so. But business name is Glazed and Confused oh, Creations. Okay. So that's what happened there. I did not know that. <laughs> I feel, is there another like Glazed Confused? Something? There's Glazed okay. and Confused, and there's a pottery guy on Facebook. Okay. Or Glazed and, like written out and. And I was just like, Glazed and Confused with Ampersand Creations. And because I signed up with Squarespace, and it took it, and I was like, yeah, cool. And then afterwards, I was looking at it after I paid for it, and the Ampersand was gone. I was like, shit what happened oh, <laughs> like, so, the, yeah. so it was so already done and i was like glazed confused creations yeah yeah, glazed, yeah website is glazed confused creations.com okay and then that's on what squarespace mm-hmm. okay yep. do you like that i do i do okay. it has all the so it actually inter uh mingles too with square so like my website on which is a whole other thing but my inventory that's on my website, I can check out with Square in person and update my oh, website cool. inventory. I should tell Rachel that because they're talking about that for their boutique shop, and they have I think they have Wix, but they use Square for their point of sale at the shops. Yeah. So now I can tell her like Squarespace or Square. I mean, Square has their option of yes. like website platform and stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's okay. Good. So you can still do your reporting in Square, but it Sweet, that's good. But it only worked. 
could have bought an iPad for doing the sales because it only is through the iPad app. It's not through the Android app, which is why I don't use it anymore. <laughs> because the, score, the Squarespace side? Like, yeah, this in terms of doing that checkout, like in person to getting it to link, you have to go through the the, the um, iPhone app, not the Android app wow. version. But I know that's weird. It's dumb. <laughs> okay. So I was like, all right, we're gonna do this, and then like. Because my iPad, I didn't put it on my phone plan. I was trying to hot, well, hot spot the iPad, and like photos mm -hmm. wouldn't load up, and I was just like, "This uh, is not fun. We're not going to do this anymore." Yeah. <laughs> but like, for if you're in a in a shop that has a steady connection, yeah. It'd and be then great. The inventory, yeah, inventory is really important for them. So right, like, and they track you, all that, and you can run reports on all that. And yeah, because it is tough for some people that sell like in person and online, and they. I mean, I just have to separate inventory. Like, there's no way for me to be, to do that otherwise. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to double check my inventory every single time before I go to show, make sure I take things offline and don't, I mean, yeah, the risk of me selling something online and in a, at a show that I took is, like, kind of slim, but I feel forgetting like, to take it offline after I get home is the thing. Yeah, so. Beck and I have both had that happen, like, within the last month. Like, Dang it, we missed it. Yeah. <laughs> we missed that one. But. And then you have to make stuff I guess yes quick enough if you can hopefully yep I mean your shipping is pretty standard too being that it's smaller boxes mm -hmm. and whatnot so yeah. it's probably pretty easy to it's just standard to do check out and all yeah. that it's not you're not working with functional pottery that changes in weights no. and sizes a ton so yeah it all just goes in the bubble mailer okay all right, Deanna, thanks so much yeah, for your time. Yeah, thank you so much for good luck for the rest of the weekend. Thanks, you too. We're gonna have good sales. I feel yes. Like. Good day. Like. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Yo, 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 yo. It's Becca here. Hey, just so you know, thank you for listening. And also, we have... What do we have again? A Patreon. A Patreon. We have a Patreon that you should go and... If you want to donate to you could donate to it. If you don't, that's cool, too. But um, just Google Wheel Talk Podcast Patreon. Don't do the other one because uh, there is a Wheel Talk on Patreon, but it's not us. So make sure you get the right one. It's and in the show notes. It's in the show notes. And also, um, leave us a review because they're fun to read. Okay, bye.